Good evening, Mercy View. My name is Jema, and I am a partner here, and I'm going to be reading tonight from uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. And before I start, I just want to say thank you, Sean. Thank you. We're so blessed that you're going to be one of our shepherds. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at Mercy View. Actually, I get that, that actually matters tonight. Um, it's plural, pastors, and uh, that's a cool thing to be able to say again, friends. So, um, But hey, this is a, a little different evening. Uh, typically, when we come together, we are walking through a book of the Bible or uh, a series of messages on a topic of some kind, and uh, we're pushing pause on that tonight because we have some special things we need to chat about tonight. Um, tonight, we are having a family meeting. So let me just say a couple things about that. First, what that means is if you're a partner with us here at Mercy View, what we call members, um, this meeting in particular is for you. Uh, we want you to have an opportunity to continue to hear what's on the heart of uh, the leadership here at Mercy View. And, uh, but the other thing that I would want to say, too, is if you're here tonight and you're like, man, I can't believe I picked the family meeting night to come visit Mercy View. And they're just going to kind of talk about, you know, in-house stuff. I want to encourage you to um, uh, stay, stay engaged because um, what we're going to be talking about tonight um, is an opportunity for you to hear the heartbeat of who we are. And as you're considering where you might plant your flag or be a part of a local church and be a member there, um, some of what we talk about tonight might be something that would be encouraging to you as you think about, would I fit here in this church body? And so tonight we just want to take the normal time we would usually take in our uh, sermon time and, and, and talk some, uh, some business as it relates to um, our church. So um, as you know, the directional team has been meeting since April of, of 2023. Uh, we have been spending a lot of time in conversation about what we feel like the Lord might be up to next for us as it relates to a, a, a new location, a, a possible move to a Sunday morning worship gathering and trying to figure out, is that here? Is that somewhere else? Are we going to buy? Are we going to lease? Are we going to rent? Obviously, conversation has really been going on even before that because We've invited you into a season of fasting and praying. And if you've been a part of that, if you've been participating in that, I just, we just want to say thank you. Um, we believe that your prayers uh, have went to the heart of God and have been a part of what's brought us to this place uh, tonight. But as the directional team uh, began to have focused conversations, as the, uh, we began to talk with other ministry leaders here at Mercy View, personal conversations have happened a lot even in the last couple of weeks. Um, we sent a survey out to you. Many of you have uh, taken the opportunity to, to fill that out. That's been super helpful. 
Um, as we bring all of that information into the mix and as we consider what the Lord might be, we just want to say a few things. We want to first say thank you for your engagement as partners. Uh, we are a, a elder-led but partner-engaged church. And as partners here, we really desire for you to be engaged. And so we want you to know that we have listened. Um, we have heard you. We have been challenged by uh, your comments and questions. We have been sharpened by your engagement. In fact, I would say that you've helped clarify and, and strengthen us as we are trying to make the most wise and strategic decision as a church about what's next. So after all of that, um, we are happy to share with you tonight that you have affirmed that our next season as a body for gathered worship is to move to Sunday mornings at Wilson Teaching and Learning Academy beginning on Sunday, October the 1st. So thank you for the way that you have participated in this, helped us get to this place tonight to see that this is what the Lord uh, is doing. And this particular decision in and of itself, um, uh, we, we recognize that there are many things to consider, uh, things to practically walk through and think, think about. And so as we uh, do some of that tonight, uh, I hope you're encouraged as we talk about that. But here's what I want to do this evening on behalf of the elders, again, plural. Um, that's exciting to say. Uh, in a sense, what we really want to do tonight is as we have sensed this affirmation from you, we want to, in, in a way, turn or move to the next page of the story tonight. Some of what's on the next page, I get, is practical. Like, how are we going to do what the Lord wants us to do? Again, the comments and questions that you've given us have been super helpful, super sharpening for us. And you're going to find that um, we're going to respond to some of that as we go along tonight. But tonight, as we've thought and prayed and considered what we want to communicate tonight... Um, it's really this. It's what does the Lord want from us as we move into this next season of ministry? How we're going to do that practically is important. We've, we've shared much of that already with you. We, we, we know there's more conversation and, and work ahead of us. But tonight really is, is more theological, philosophical, how we need to tune our hearts to God's ways in the days ahead. So if you have your Bibles, keep them open to Mark chapter 8 that you heard Jamie read, beginning in verse 27. I'm not going to read all of this again. We might see some of this as we move through. I'll read some of it. But just keep it open there because we're going to be referencing this as we go along. But uh, as you look there, um, this passage that we're looking at tonight really comes in the very middle of the Gospel of Mark. And if you know anything about the Gospel of Mark, the first eight chapters of the Gospel of Mark are really answering one question, and it's this, who is Jesus? And it's interesting, as we get to our passage tonight, we really find um, the answer to that question starting to bubble up. And, and, and Peter, in particular, the outspoken, the heart on his sleeve, brash apostle who is a mixture of faith and doubt. He is in particular beginning to really understand the question of the first part of Mark. He really starts to get who Jesus is, sort of. He says in verse 29 to Jesus, you are the Christ. And the reason why I say Peter sort of is getting it right is because of what else happens in this passage. Now, when Peter says that Jesus is the Christ, he's using a word that literally means the anointed one or the Messiah. In other words, he's not just saying to Jesus, you are a king. He is acknowledging that Jesus is the king, the king to end all kings, the true and better king. And when Peter says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, Jesus responds by saying, yes, you're right. But then notice what happens immediately in verse 31. Jesus says, yes, I am a king, I am the king, but I'm not anything like the king that you were expecting, Peter. This is a very pivotal moment in the life and ministry of, of Jesus. 
one that really separates Jesus from prophets and religious leaders that preceded him and that would ever come after him. Look at verse 31 again. Here are the two things that I want to invite you to see this evening that Jesus says about himself. Jesus is first saying, yes, I'm a king, but I'm a king on a cross. But the second thing he's saying is found down in verse 34. Look there if you would. Jesus says this, if you want to follow me as that king, you have to go to a cross too. So let's take a look at these two ideas. First, the king on a cross. Look at verse 31. Jesus says that the son of man must suffer. I want to look at that phrase just for a moment. It's profound and just a few words there, but... First of all, son of man. Let's look at that. In the Old Testament, Daniel 7, for example, there is a reference to one like a son of man. And this son of man that that Daniel was referencing was a divine messianic figure who would come with the heavenly host to put everything right. And here in Mark, Jesus is doing something amazing. He is, he is saying, I am that son of man. He is identifying himself with that when he calls himself that phrase, the son of man. But then he says that the son of man must suffer. Jesus is really bringing two ideas together again at this point in human history that have never been brought together. The, the idea that this Messiah, the anointed one, the son of man, this divine messianic figure would actually be one who would suffer for his people. And that idea would have not made a whole lot of sense to the first hearers. The Messiah was supposed to come and make everything right in the world through power. How could he defeat evil and injustice by being killed? Now that was staggering, or those two ideas were staggering, but on top of that, Jesus doesn't just say, that the Son of Man will suffer, although he would. Notice the word that Jesus uses. He says, the Son of Man must suffer. That little word, must, is probably one of the most significant words in the entire Bible. Now, why would it be absolutely necessary for Jesus to die? Well, the answer to that question has been wrestled with in the Christian church for 20 centuries. When you look into the scriptures, when you look into Christian theology, you're going to find a few answers. But for the sake of our time tonight, I want to zero in to just one, and it is this. Jesus had to die because it was absolutely necessary, and hang with me here, legally. What do I mean by that? Well, let's get at answering that question this way. Think about it in this way. When someone really wrongs you, there's always a debt to be paid by someone. Like, think about this in your life. What if someone robs you of happiness? At least that's what you perceive. Maybe someone robs you of your reputation. Maybe someone robs you of an opportunity that you thought was yours. There are really only two things that can happen as a result of that. Either you make them pay the debt, or you can say in your heart and sometimes to their face something very counterintuitive, which is, I'll pay the debt. I forgive you. In other words, either you make them pay the cost, you harm their opportunities, you, you hope for or, or actually uh, make them suffer, But there's only one problem with that approach. As you're making them suffer because of what they did to you, you're becoming like them. You're becoming colder. You're becoming harder. You're becoming like the perpetrator. But there is another option. Instead of making them pay, you can absorb the cost of what was done. Now, I know if, if you're like me, what's bubbling up a little bit as you start to hear this is you're saying, Brad, just forgive. Like, that's not fair. Where is the justice in that? And if that is the train of thought you have, you're actually on to something. When you refuse vengeful thoughts or actions against someone who has harmed you, listen, it hurts. 
When you refrain, when you forgive, it sometimes feels like agony. Why is that? It's because you are actually, literally, in some sense, suffering. And why are you suffering? Because you are, listen, absorbing the cost. Instead of making them suffer, you're absorbing the debt. Friends, that's what forgiveness really is at its center. Forgiveness always includes suffering. Think about it. If you've truly been wrong and you forgive, you are practicing the way of Jesus. And you, the forgiver, suffer. Somebody has to pay. They pay or you pay. But here's what I'm getting at. If, if we know on a human level that forgiveness always includes suffering for the forgiver, and if we know at our human level that the only way you have any hope of righting wrongs is by paying the cost of suffering, why should it surprise us when God says, the only way I can forgive the sins of the human race is if I suffer? In other words, either you are going to pay the penalty for the sin, or I will. Friends, the only way God, through his son Jesus, can forgive us is if he goes to the cross and absorbs it himself. That's what we see on the cross. He is doing something legally, in a sense, that there is a spiritual debt that we owe, and he is saying, I'll take the sentence of death on my back. I'll take the guilty verdict of sin. I'll make this right by absorbing the judgment. I'm not going to change your lives by going to a, a throne. I'm going to change your lives by going to a cross. Friends, the world can't be changed and renewed. And your life can't be changed and renewed unless... Jesus dies for you in your place. His death was necessary for forgiveness and salvation. There's no other way. I'm in. So. That's the first thing that Jesus wants to say to us. The second thing Jesus says in our passage today, though, it's super important, and it's connected to that, and it's this. Since I am a king on a cross, if you want to follow me, you have to bear a cross as well. Look there, if you would, with me at verse 34 again. Jesus says that if anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, it is very important to understand what this means, because if we just said that Jesus took the cross for us, for our forgiveness, why would we need to take up our cross? I see a couple of things in our passage here that answers that question, I believe. First, you take up your cross because you now have a new identity. Jesus says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. That word life there in that verse is a word that means psyche. It's the word where we get our word psychology. It's a word that means identity, your sense of self. And Jesus wants us to find ourselves by not building our identity on gaining things in the world, like he says in verse 36 and 37. Here's what Jesus wants. He says, every culture points to certain things and says that if you will gain this or that, if you acquire this or that, if you achieve a certain thing, then you will know you're somebody. Then you will know you're valuable. That is what gives you your identity. Whether it's a traditional or individualistic culture that you find yourself in, whether it's an Eastern or Western culture that you find yourself in, it's performance-based. It's achievement-based. But ultimately, those things are not about God. It's about you. And Jesus comes along and says, friends, that will not work. He says, you can gain the whole world and not have an identity. 
He's saying that no matter how much of the things that you gain, it's never enough to really make you sure of who you are. You will always be asking, if you're running after the world, will this give me identity? Will this give me my sense of self, a a sense of significance and importance? You will be asking over and over and over, am I enough? See, the only thing that can really completely change a life is through accepting what Jesus has done into your life. What did Jesus do on the cross? In a sense, he lost his identity so that you could have one. For a brief time, he lost his relationship with his father, which was the source of his identity, to pay the price of sin so that you could have, so that I could have free grace, the adoption of sons as sons and daughters of the father. That's what real love is, friends. So if you can see the son of God loving you like that, And it's not just an idea, it's not just knowledge that you bring into your your mind, but rather it's something that has moved you in your heart experientially. You'll begin to get the strength, the assurance. You'll begin to get a sense of your own value and distinctiveness, which is not based on anything that you might be doing. It's based on what Jesus has done for you. And Jesus is saying here in our passage that when we receive the gospel into our lives like that, we are taking up our cross. So first we said that you take up your cross because you now have a new identity. But second, you take up your cross because you now have a new agenda. Look back with me at verse 32. One of the most stunning passages in Scripture, in my opinion, when Peter hears Jesus is going to Jerusalem... And that entails suffering and death. He is furious. It actually says that Peter himself took Jesus aside and rebuked him. Can you imagine that? Peter rebuking Jesus? But here's the question. Why was Peter attempting to rebuke Jesus? I believe it is because Peter had an agenda. Peter's agenda didn't include a cross. It didn't include suffering. He thought Jesus was going to get Peter to Peter's agenda. And when he sees Jesus is not going to do that, Peter lays into Jesus. But what does Jesus do? Jesus looks at Peter and tells Satan to get behind him. Jesus is counter-rebuking Peter here, not him personally, but the thought that, that Peter had as something satanic because he did not see Jesus as the messianic ruler of God's eternal kingdom coming to rule and to reign through suffering and death. So think about it this way. If, if you and I come to Jesus and we say, well, Jesus, I'll obey you if you're not really obeying. You're negotiating. But that's not how it works according to Jesus. If Jesus is the king, you don't negotiate with the king. You submit to the king. Right? With kings, you lay your sword at their feet and say, your agenda is now my agenda. And if Jesus was only a king, you'd have to submit to him because, or you would feel like you might have to submit to him because you'd have to. But Jesus is a king who went to a cross for you. So how much more should we come to him and say, Lord, whatever you want, whatever you say, whatever you do, I will will run after that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you, you said, not my will, but thine be done for me. Now I say, not my will, but thine be done for you. Friends, how can you and I come to grips with someone who gave himself utterly for you without giving yourself utterly for him? When he says, go to the cross, he means this, die to your comfort, die to your convenience, die to your ease, die to your false pursuits of identity, die to your agendas, and take up mine. So this brings me to our move to Wilson. I want to hone in on this last point just for a moment as we think about what is ahead of us at WLTA. 
And here's what I, I want to say. I believe it is time for us to consider the ways in which the Lord wants us to take up our cross in this next season of ministry so that we can align ourselves with his agenda for our church. Let me just talk about a few of the reasons why again. First, it, it is practical in a sense for us to, to make this move. In order for us to have the capacity one day to secure our own permanent location, we must grow. And as we shared with you, we, we need to see uh, uh, over 40 new giving partners, like new giving partners. That is a reality that is hard to face up to, but it is one we have to face up to. Yes, we have recovered our pre-pandemic partner numbers, but we've not yet grown beyond that. Let me just give you a point of reference here. In the 40 months that we've been here at Memorial, we've added about 60 partners. When we were, excuse me, 40 partners. When we were at Wilson, we added 60 in the same amount of time. That's about a ratio of two to one. And so as we look at things like that, the question that we keep coming back to is where do we best position ourselves for reaching our city? And that's why the decision has been made. You've affirmed that to move strategically to the step before the step to position ourselves for that very thing one day to have our own space. But here's why. This is not about just being bigger. Or, or to just necessarily even to have a building. It's actually a missional idea. When Jesus says that we must lose our life for the sake of the gospel, I think this is another implication. Again, first and foremost, it is what we've already said. We must lose our attempts to save ourselves and let Jesus save us through his gospel. But there's another sense here where I think Jesus is saying that we must lose our lives for the sake of the movement of the gospel as well. In other words, the gospel is both the good news of what Jesus has done for us in his life, his death, and resurrection. But the gospel is also a, a thing that is meant to move from where it is to where it isn't. The gospel of the kingdom says that God has many in this city who are his people. And you and I are to be about the gospel work of losing our lives for the sake of reaching those people. Are you with me in that? Like, even in a city like Tulsa to provide another front door to our church for people to meet us and to be engaged with us and to meet Jesus ultimately, friends, that's a missional move. And it serves you, if you're a partner here or, or, or a, a visitor with us, it will serve you. We, our desire is to serve you. But there are people that we don't even know yet that God intends to bring into our spiritual family for the sake of the movement of the gospel in our city and beyond. But there is another reason that, that we've had a growing sense among us as leaders that we need to make a change. And this is a felt thing. There's not necessarily something that I can point specifically to, but if you, if you want to talk about it, I could probably give you some examples of things that I have in mind. But there's been a growing sense that there is a restlessness that you and I have on Sunday nights. Maybe even a, a bit of a, uh, an apathy that, that has set in. We've been here almost three years, and we praise the Lord for the graciousness of this space. It's been a shelter for us. But a return to Sunday mornings in particular is exciting because we really see it as a catalyst for new energy and hope and vision. But it also allows us to function, we believe, more on the Lord's time. Meeting together in the morning on the Lord's day helps us frame the reality of Sabbath in our lives because it's the first thing that we do on his day. We're gonna less likely consider the Lord's day as something we, we uh, that end that way if we do it at the end of the weekend. But a day dedicated to the Lord, begun in worship, we think will lead to a less distracted, tired, worn out people. It's gonna require a reorientation. It's gonna require some retraining. Believe me, 
I'm in that boat. But change is good. And we believe that this change is good. As I said, it'll spark new vision and new energy and hope. And here's one of the encouraging things that we've begun to see. Obviously, one of the biggest concerns that we have as we go to Wilson is like, how are we going to pull that off because of what it requires? And we've had 15 plus people already commit to being a part of the Set Up and Tear Down team. Um, that's almost 60% of where we need to be. On top of those who have said, I'm in, that are part of worship and AV and Mercy View kids, the Lord is beginning to move and to confirm this call that we have to move. In fact, we are so excited about this, we have already begun to make some plans to figure out some things to really help serve our, our people well, those that will be a part of those teams. I just want to give you some dates to remember as we move forward. First, on Thursday, August the 17th, um, the leaders um, that will be, uh, you know, particularly leaders that are affected by the, the setup and teardown, the ministry that happens during the worship time there, uh, are going to be taking a tour of Wilson Teaching and Learning Academy. Some of us, it'll be a return tour. Um, we'll be seeing space that we've seen before, but for some of our other leaders, this will be a new space. And it's going to help us wrap our heads and hearts around, you know, what are the needs? What are the things that we want to do? As well as think about how can we scale what we want to do in such a way that it, it serves the team that's doing that well, maybe simplify some things, that maybe do some things differently than we did before. On Sunday, this is a very important date, Sunday, or excuse me, Saturday, uh, September 9th, um, we are going to have an all-church volunteer training, and we need you to be here for that, and this is the breakdown of that morning, and really this is to prepare us for the fall. Um, from 9 to 11, if you're a, a GC leader, you should have gotten an email this week on this, we're going to have a, a time of training. Uh, the GC training time is in particular to prepare us for the fall sermon series, um, that's coming up. And then at 11 o'clock, we're going to just really have everybody that's a volunteer here at Mercy View in the same room be here at, at, at Memorial at, uh, uh, in the Fellowship Hall. And we're going to talk through next steps as it relates to the move to, uh, to Wilson. And then at 12 o'clock, for everybody that's still around, we're going to provide lunch. Um, for those that were part of the all group volunteer training, you're happy to grab lunch. Uh, we're happy for you to grab lunch and go if you need to. But we're going to take an hour with our Mercy View kids, do a little training, and do a working lunch with them for about an hour. So it's a full morning. If you're a part of all those areas, we recognize that. But we're trying to knock it out in one uh, spot so that we don't need to do multiple meetings. Some of you have asked about the dress rehearsal idea, getting things set up just to make sure things are working well. Um, that is in the works. That, that is uh, the, the plan. Um, we're not sure exactly when that's going to happen. When we did go to Wilson the last time, it happened on the same weekend, I believe. Um, we, we were able to leave our stuff up. So ideally, that would be great if we could do that. But uh, we'll, we'll be in touch with you on, on that specific date. But then Sunday, October the 1st, moving to Wilson Teaching and Learning Academy. Uh, we're excited about the opportunity the Lord is providing for us. Friends, I, I think that um, I'd like to end here. We're, we're being called in this moment in the life of our church into something larger than ourselves. And God, I think, is, is calling me, us, to not first act, how will this move affect me, but rather, how can I consider, in the spirit of Philippians 2, the interest of others? And let me just share one last thing um, that I've been really convicted of the last couple of weeks. I uh, will be celebrating, on October the 1st, actually, of all things, I'll be celebrating my 47th birthday. And if I get to live to be 90, which is, it's up to the Lord, I've lived over half of my life already. I am growing in my understanding of my mortality. And this is really the, the thing that has been popping up in my own heart. Um, I got one shot at this. I got one shot at this, this opportunity in life. This is the moment in time that God has chosen for me to be born and to live and to pour myself out like a drink offering. And it reminded me of the passage in James that says... Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. 
What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. We have one life to live. I believe the Lord is calling us to make the most of this moment that God has given us. Let's present ourselves as living sacrifices. Let's lose our lives for the sake of the gospel, reaching our hearts and those who don't yet know that God has in this city. Let's pray together.